Hey everyone, welcome yeah. back. Uh, I see you again is, is ready. So uh, let me say a few words before, before I hand over to him. Um, I'm sure many, many of you do know Jürgen. When we registered people at the conference, uh, some of our attendees asked specifically um, uh, to participate in his lecture. So, so Jürgen, you're, you're also famous here uh, in Poland. Um, well, th there, is, there is probably nothing I can say that you, that you wouldn't know, but um, Jürgen is a specialist in scale framework called LESS that I believe uh, many of us heard about. Uh, he also was a change leader in one of the biggest European uh, health services and the author of a few books as, and a specialist in a concept of gaming in a fairly serious organizations. So how to, how to connect gaming and fun with, uh, with, with doing business. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Jürgen. So, okay. So that being said, I have a pleasure and honor to introduce our second keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Jürgen Ismay. Uh, Jürgen, stage is yours. Okay, let me let me share the screen. Uh, there we go. You all see the screen now? All say hi. Yes. Nobody can say I. Uh, then again, there's uh, 80 plus people. I see possibly you can actually open up your video streams. Not, uh, I, I'm pretty sure you cannot unmute yourself. That's okay. So, but some faces to look at would be nice. You know, I'm an introvert. And if you give a presentation without faces to, to talk to, that's going to be pretty annoying. So more videos would be awesome. Thank you for that. Now, uh, a wave yeah i see lots of people waving so that's cool thank you um my name is Jürgen. i call myself a simplification officer by the way so i'm not going to add more complex structures in organizations i'm going to demolish and if you look at less large-scale scrum it's not about a scaling framework it's actually a descaling framework then again we are here today with empirical up they say level up but i dislike levels because then you have the organizations going like are you a level one agile organization or a level two agile organization and this brings more dysfunction then it's useful so let's keep it with empirical up and not empirical level up so thanks for that uh, we're going to use empiricism on product backlogs today are you ready for it ah some people are awake already so cool stuff first things first and I need to click first on my slides so that my clicker is going to work. Anyhow, so first things first, what I see many organizations still doing is building products by means of contracts, project contracts, program contracts, physical contracts, where you have a party A that has a problem and money to spend, and you have a party B that will earn their money by delivering a solution to the problem. You can call them business and IT or business and R&D. It could be an external party A and an internal party B. So this is what I see often happening. They do some negotiations on scope, time and money. And at a certain moment in time, they say, OK, it's approved. Check. We can move on. This is the starting line. So the moment that they say check, when they have a starting line, they already have the deadline fixed as well, didn't they? You see this becoming very familiar in many organizations in different formats. Of course, when the deadline hits, it's not really done. We could consider it almost done. Because we still need to do lots of defect fixing. We need to build in better performance, better quality. We need to deal with lots of change requests. So the, the real done, 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 the truly done is most probably coming later, isn't it? And for this, I want to pick your brains a bit. So please open up the this talk's Slack channel to give me some of your input. Are you ready? Yeah. So the first question I have for you related to this picture of fixing something like one year up front in scope, time, and money. If we now look at scope, and I want to ask you a number, a percent RC. RC doesn't stand for remote control for the geeks amongst us. RC stands for requirement changes. 
So if you look at the initial scope, which we fixed in the contract one year up front, and then the really truly done, 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 done state, when really everything is finished, no defects, everything is okay, working as it should be. So how much of this initial scope has been changed? So how much scope has been thrown away, added, changed completely? Put a number, a percentage, gut feeling from your past experiences. So I see 80% change, 50, 70, 10%. That's uh, very optimistic. So 60, 70, 75, 80, 50%, 80%, 63%. So things are going fine. So keep it going. We are going to swamp slack now. That's cool. Now 20%, 60%. So we have quite a lot of percentages already there. So that's one part of it. Let's move to a second part. 100% change, 200% change, cool. So if I ask you now, if we look at time and money, and I ask you to give me a percentage, the difference between the actuals versus the estimated. So percent A, V is E. So meaning when we sign off the contract, where we have the starting point there, we fix time and we fix the money, the budget we have available to spend on people, machines, and all the rest. So versus the don, 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 truly don state. What would be the percentage difference, both of them, one number? 200, 300, 75, 50. So we're getting in similar, similar domains as the requirement changes, by the way, at this moment in time. 300%, whoa, look at that. 150, 150, 30. So also there, there's like quite a lot of difference, quite a lot of big numbers popping up, isn't it? So if we now look at this kind of scope thing, time and money, what do we see happening in most of the organizations? Party A understands their problem. So they also understand the solution. Of course they do. So that's why they define scope. And from within scope, they ask party B to come up with time and money, isn't it? So business is defining this is what we need, and then they give it to the IT department and say, tell us when, when will we get it and how much will it cost? Valid questions, by the way. So we assume if we need to distill time and money from scope, then we assume a certain kind of productivity in our organization, don't we? Yes, we do. Otherwise, we cannot come to time and money. So if we assume a certain kind of productivity, then the third number I want to ask you to write down is hashtag FP. It's not hashtag me too, by the way. So hashtag FP is the, the factors that could influence productivity. How many factors could influence productivity in a one year time frame? If we look now today, the COVID is already one factor. If a flu epidemic would hit us, that's a second factor. If the third, if your senior software engineer leaves the company because they can get better pay rates at another company, that's a third factor. So how many factors can you think of that could influence productivity within a one year time frame? That's a number, Silvia, I, that's a number I cannot even pronounce. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Infinite, that's the flat eight. A lot, <laughs> 12, a lot. So a lot is not a number, of course. A lot is, is something you bid on. Uh, anyhow, some, some cool stuff. So what did we now see with the three numbers? I don't need research papers, by the way. I don't need scientific research in form whatsoever. What I see now in the Slack channel by just asking those three questions, I didn't see anybody popping up with zero, zero, zero. Or in Spanish, zero, zero, zero. So nobody came up with three times zero. So what could we now conclude? We could conclude that this kind of contract thing there in the beginning, that it's an illusion. We need to accept that whatever we put in the contract is an illusion. We have to absorb variation. All your numbers over there is a sign, a piece of evidence. For me, I don't need research paper because now I have group evidence. You have given me the evidence that this thing is an illusion that we need to absorb variation. We need to have, accept a rework. We have to learn along the way. And if we say learn, then we need to go to this kind of learning cycle, which is at the heart of Scrum. They call it Scrum theory in the Scrum guides. And I dislike this very much because once people see theory, that's the chapter they skip. 
theory is boring, so let's skip this chapter and immediately move on with the rest. And then they have lousy Scrum implementations. So I would call it the heart of Scrum. It's the learning cycle, this inspect, adapt on transparency. And pedicle up, isn't it? So the tagline of this conference. In the lean world, they might call it PDCA, you know, this plan, do, check, act cycle. Deming actually rephrased it to make it a lot more clear that it's about learning. It's actually called plan, do, study, act. But let's keep it with the Scrum implementation, inspect, adapt, transparency. At least that's one, uh, one uh, name less that we need to bother about. So inspect, adapt, transparency. We need it. Otherwise, we cannot deal with all your numbers with your own evidence, is it? So that's step one. Secondly, if we want to apply empiricism on a product backlog, we need to figure out what would be the main purpose now of a product backlog. So use Slack, by the way, to express what do you think is the main purpose of a product backlog? Let's see. A goal, so we have a soccer game ongoing, we score goals, a to-do list. Keep it going. So what would be the main purpose of a product backlog? You know, Scrum is the most popular practice these days to execute upon software products. So there must be lots of ideas there. To be able to manage, have flexible scope, making sure we're doing what's most valuable, prioritize features, plan of work. And then people read the new Scrum guides, we get product goal, wishes, vision. Ah, I like vision there. So cool. Even though Scrum is the most popular and so-called so easy thing to do, we see there's lots of different perceptions on what do we think is the main purpose of a product backlog. I even see lots of practices coming up. If we say main purpose, a practice is generally not a purpose because if the main purpose is a practice, we are stuck. And then we cannot uncover better ways. You know, the first sentence in the Agile Manifesto, uncover better ways. If we think the main purpose is a practice, we get stuck. We cannot be agile anymore, is it? So if I think about main purpose, then we need to go back to the heart of Scrum. And if I say the main purpose of a product backlog, to me at least, it's about providing the highest level possible of transparency on a possible future. We don't know if this is going to be the future. Nobody has this glass bowl to look in and define this is going to be the future. So it's transparency on a possible future. And now we need to close this learning loop, of course. We need to go and inspect and adapt. So we don't inspect the product backlog, don't we? We inspect the potential shippable product increment or increment this is the main purpose there is transparency on what is. And I really mean the complete what is. I see too many people going like, we, do, we only show what we did in the last sprint, but what you did in the last sprint might have an effect on the whole product. So we need to inspect the what is completely because this is going to give us more interesting information to adapt our possible future, of course. If we say inspect and adapt, we inspect the increment, we adapt the possible future that we have, we do this in sprint review. If we now see sprint review, what is the main purpose over there? It's learning on product level. We need to absorb your evidence at that moment in time. If we do not absorb your evidence, we tend to believe in the illusion. And this is bad behavior because you have given the evidence that the illusion is something we need to accept. We cannot ignore it. We need to accept learning. So if we go to a sprint review session and we inspect what is, and I don't see anything being added, thrown away, or completely changed in the product backlog for the first review session, then I'm OK. If the review session after that one, we go there and they inspect, and there's nothing being added, thrown away, or completely changed in this product backlog, then I'm a bit worried. If the third Re sprint review session, nothing is being added, thrown away, or really changed in the product backlog. It means we are not applying Scrum. We are using practices from Scrum to comply to the illusion and ignoring your own evidence completely. So this would not be Scrum, it would be a status meeting. Because we believe in the illusion and there we just track if we are on speed, 
with the illusion we have created. So we need to accept things. We need to change stuff. We need to adapt. We need to absorb your evidence during that meeting. Otherwise, we are ignorant people. For that purpose, there is this nice metric which a friend of mine came up with, and that's Terry's Agility Index. So Terry is a fellow less colleague of mine, less coach, by the way. So he's very technical as well. And jokingly, he came up with Terry's Agility Index, the percentage of new items during a sprint that came out of the sprint review before. It cannot be 100% because that would mean you have a very weak possible future of your product, of course. It cannot be zero because then you would not absorb any of your evidence. So this is already a nice metric you can put in place to see, are we applying Scrum as it is intended to, to learn and absorb your evidence, or are we just like the ostrich technology, we put our head in the sand and we believe in the illusion. So that's step one. If we now know that we need to absorb variation, we need to absorb your learning, and we know that the product backlog main purpose is to provide transparency on a possible future, then we can try to uncover better ways. We can try to be more agile in that perspective. So let me show you an alternative for your product backlog that is enabling business discovery and delivery. And I really say discovery and delivery because you cannot deconnect the discovery and delivery away from each other. Because this is about validated learning. The validation of your learning is there when you put the software in the hands of the end users. Everything before that might limit the risk that you make the wrong assumptions, but the validation of your learning is in eating the pudding, putting the software in the hands of the users. So we need discovery, learning, or in other words, and delivery needs to go hand in hand. If we say business related, then we need to start with some kind of business goal, isn't it? So we start with setting up this widely important goal, something that would drive business forward. So we also need to understand now, because it's all about learning, the things that we do, are we now really impacting, or are we really moving towards that widely important goal or away? So we need some kind of trend metric. And this is what I want to do with a product owner in a less environment. What is the goal we want to achieve? Make it as small as possible, because then we can learn faster if the, the scope is narrow. If it's a very wide one, then the learning goes slower. So we do this with a product owner. If we then ask, dear product owner, give me some kind of trend metric that can show us if we are approaching the goal, yes or not, then I generally get lag metrics. Meaning we get some metrics that we can start measuring after it's being put into production and running for a couple of months. Like revenue, like customer acquisitions, like customer satisfaction, the general quality of a product. So those are lack metrics. Those are not good enough to help us steer the boat and make sure we do the right stuff. So together with the teams involved, and if I say teams, let's say we have eight teams, so generally 50, 60 people in a room, then with those 50, 60 people, we are going to try to figure out what are some lead metrics. Also trends, of course, because trends is giving us a sense if we're doing the right things or the wrong things. A static number is not. So what are lead metrics that we can validate or evaluate at least every sprint, preferably sooner and faster, by the way, but at least every sprint that we can approach this widely important goal. If we define lead metrics, then we take an assumption. We really take an assumption. We make the assumption that if the lead metric is moving in the right direction, that also the lack metric will move in the right direction. That's a clear assumption. We need to make this explicit. To give you an example, if the lack metric would be, I want to lose some weight, and I could lose some weight, by the way. So if I put myself on the weighing thing, that would be the lack metric, because whatever I did before will not change anymore. This is the lack metric, what the scale is giving me. So much kilograms, this is a lack metric. If I then think about lead metric, what would be appropriate lead metrics to have that lack metric? Then I could say exercise, sports. So sports could be a lead metric. The more I, I do sports, the more I will most probably influence my, my weight. 
but maybe it's not enough. Maybe I also need to put in the intake of calories, for example. I need to calculate the calories I eat every day fair and the sports. So if I do both those lead metrics, then I have the assumption that my weight will change. I tried it, it worked. So I validated this assumption. So I want to have the lead metrics designed by the team members themselves. Because if the lead metrics are designed by the team members, they will be more engaged to make sure that we move the needle. So that's why I do this in the refinement sessions with the 60 people. We brainstorm on lead metrics. We validate within the group, which would be the most appropriate one, where we take the least risk towards that lack metrics. And then we can move forward. What else do I want with the product owner? I want the product owner to say, how much money are you willing to bet? How much money are you willing to invest to move the needles on this widely important goal? And this is giving a creative constraint to the teams. You might say, I want to invest four sprints, three sprints, seven sprints, whatever. So what kind of money are you willing to invest to move the needle? This is a creative constraint. And in, in, if you consider the scope time money, for example, <coughs> if we say scope and I give it to a developer, and I say, okay, this is the scope, give me time and money. Then by default, the developer will gold plate. I will do the same, eh? because if you give me scope, then I will design a system where I will be proud if I can develop this. So I will gold plate for sure. And then the time and money comes up and then party A will say, yeah, that's a great solution, but 20% less, 20% less time, 20% less money available, whatever. So 20% less, they give it back to me. And they come like, you can, so this is a great solution. They love it very much, but it should be 20% cheaper. So 20% less effort to put in there. And then I will take my own design and I will scratch things. I will not even rethink for a new solution. I will just scratch stuff. What do you think will happen with my engagement, my motivation to build that thing again? <laughs> Goes down the drain, isn't it? So this is not the right approach. That's why I prefer to say now at this moment in time, dear product owner, tell the people like how much money you're willing to invest in this solution and then let them discover the best possible approach. The teams will take it into consideration, you know? And sometimes it will be less and sometimes it will be a bit more and that's about it. As a product owner, a business product owner, you have the right metrics now in front of you to help making decisions. Because now you see your investment being put away, you burn money, but you also see the trend metrics either moving or not moving. So you can help making decisions what's the best approach. So this is where we have been doing in the refinement sessions with 50, 60 people involved. Then it doesn't stop there, of course, because at this moment in time, it's too loose. We don't have focus. We don't know enough to really go into sprints, is it? So we need to continue. We continue with brainstorming who's, and who's I mean customer segments, personas, types of users you have. So who can actually drive impact towards this widely important goals and the lead and lack metrics. So we brainstorm, we do this individually and then we do this silent clustering. So meaning we put our own posters together. This goes pretty rapidly, even with 50, 60 people in about 15 minutes, this is done. So now we have a, a multitude of who's that are possibly going to drive impact on this metrics and this widely important goal. What do we do at that moment in time? At that moment in time, we split this 50, 60 people into smaller teams, teams of let's say nine people, for example. And we say to team one, take the who, really physically take the who you think will drive the biggest impact on this widely important goal. So this team takes the who with them. So another team cannot take the same who. They need to go with another one. And that's cool because now we're generating options, which we later on can validate, which is the more appropriate one. This is already lots different than many scope-oriented things because we don't generate options. We just go into one option, we fix it, and off we go. Now we have a multitude of options. If one doesn't work, and we see it in the metrics, we learn that this is not working, then we have option B already prepared for us. We can immediately continue and shift gears or pivot, as they want to call it. So anyhow, 
Now we have different rules into smaller teams. Now we continue the journey. So we ask those teams to brainstorm on the how. And how is about behavior. Which kind of behavior do I want to see more of for that persona so that we drive impact? Which behavior do we want to see less of introduced or completely removed for that type of user so that we drive impact forward? This is another assumption. We assume if this behavioral change for that persona is happening, that we are going to shift the needles on the lead and the lack metrics. Another assumption we need to make very explicit because this can, might become risky. If the behavior is not driving any impact, then we need to shift gears and pivot to another solution, is it? So two assumptions are already visible now. Only at that moment in time, we're going to split these nine people groups again into two smaller teams. And we're going to ask those people to choose the how, which they think will drive the biggest impact, which will move the needles on this widely important goal the most. So now we have two hows for the same who that is going to be explored into the what. So meaning what can we do? What can we build? So that this behavior would change for that type of user and we drive impact forward. If we do stuff, if we build what's, and there's no behavioral change, then we definitely not going to drive any impact anywhere. So that's why it's clearly important that we need to understand who, what kind of behavior, and this what should influence this. So this is also an assumption. If we build something, will it indeed change behavior, yes or no? So now we have three assumptions that we need to learn from empiricism, you know? So we have three assumptions to validate. This is where we go to the lean startup, this kind of MVP. I prefer Henrik Nieberg's uh, announcements, by the way. So you have a minimum testable product or feature. You have a minimum sellable product or feature. That's when it can go to production. And you have a minimum lovable product or feature. You cannot go to lovable if you didn't test it, of course. So if we go to lean startup, then we need to validate those three assumptions as fast as we can with the lowest cost possible. That's the ID. It's not about features or this, it's about validating your assumptions so we are sure, more sure, based on data, that this is the right approach, yes or no. If we cannot validate the assumption and we cannot use the data, then every decision about feature priorities becomes political. If we have data, then it's not a political decision, it's an evidence-based decision, learning. So, and this is a crucial aspect. This is what we want to achieve within large-scale Scrum. We want to validate assumptions so that ordering and focus and all of that stuff, what is now more important, less important, becomes more driven from a data perspective and less from a political perspective. If you want to get rid about corporate politics, here you go. So if we now look, I mentioned there as well, eight teams. If we now say we have eight teams focused on this widely important goal here, and we need to validate the assumptions. If you have eight teams, seven people in every team, so meaning we have 56 people in the room, working on validating this assumption. We do a two-week sprint, so that's 10 man days in a two-week sprint, 10 work days. So this would mean that we have six, 560 man days that we spent in a single sprint. We should be able to validate at least two out of three assumptions, isn't it? If we cannot validate two out of the three assumptions by spending 560 mandates, then we have other bigger issues to tackle. If we know or in a stage where the validation of the assumption is the most important thing for us, then your product backlog might look like this lean startup machine validation board instead. Because in the context of validating assumption, this is a more appropriate visualization of your possible future than anything else, uncovering better ways. And now you might think, Jürgen, this is great. You come up with great ideas. To be honest, not of this, nothing of this is from my own brains. I'm just a good cocktail shaker, bringing things together. Because if I look at this, this widely important goal with lead and lack metrics is coming from the four disciplines of execution. The four disciplines of execution calls this setting up a winnable game. If we have the lead, lack, and a widely important goal where we align many teams towards, and then we introduce a heartbeat event, 
Scrum, for example, sprints, we introduce a heartbeat event towards this, and we learn and adapt accordingly, then we set up a winnable game. That's what the, what the four disciplines of execution is giving to us. For people that are familiar with Hoiko, his work, so another friend of mine, he's a lot more uh, fun to listen to than I am, by the way, but anyhow, so impact mapping. So the thing I needed to learn is that the how is about behavior. Too many people make the mistake in the how to already talk about the what's instead, not thinking about behavior too much. So this is what we have there. If we take big, huge, risky assumptions between the who, how, and this lead lack metrics, this widely important goal, that we might even add some practices from UX and design thinking. We do customer interviews, we do empathy maps, we create personas so that we get a clearer, more better understanding about the who. We do customer journey mapping, we might do use cases on this how, on the behavior, so that we get more of an understanding. So we limit the risk that we take the wrong assumptions. It's about limiting the risk because the validation, if this is a right or wrong thing, is by putting it in production either with a soft launch or an A-B test, but it's by putting it in production. That's where the validation, so it's limiting the risks. I would advise to only use this kind of practices and put the effort in there if we understand we take high risk assumptions. If we all of us think that we are taking low risk assumptions, then please immediately start building. And then you can use story maps as Jeff Patton used them, not story maps as a two-dimensional plan. And by the way, so I see too many people abusing story maps for two-dimensional plans. That's not the purpose. So we can use story maps to make sure we build the absolute minimum to validate all three assumptions as fast as we can. So this would be the, the other approach and setting things forward. So now our new product backlog is not a flat list. It's not even the validation board. It might be this kind of mind map on a wall where we have the huge widely important goal which we narrowed down using cohorting for example on certain specific attributes of customers uh, maybe or anything else so we make it more narrow so that we can learn faster we have the who's we have behavior we have what's on every node of our mind map we can add more information we can add the story maps, we can add the customer journey things, we can add wireframes, we can, we can add more information so that we can acquire more context about the full picture. Every line between the notes is an assumption made explicit. So the biggest mistake you can do is connecting behavior. This behavior for this who is the same behavior for another who. And then we start connecting the branches together. This is not a good option. It would dilute the focus from the most important learning because suddenly it becomes double-sided learning instead of single-sided learning. So we would not be able to validate our assumptions that explicitly anymore. So we cannot have this connection. We need to focus. If the same behavior is there and it becomes more important, that that moment in time we can adapt emergent solutions, as we want to say it. It also means that the eight teams that we had now working and focused on this one widely important goal, that they will need to collaborate together and find ways to do discovery and delivery together with the same people, with the same people involved, because the learning need to be accepted and the shared learning need to be within the teams. So it means at certain moments in time, people will be more actively working on discovery. At other moments in time, it's going to be more actively working on delivery and so forth. It means we don't have this kind of user experience guru only working on discovery. Because if delivery is more important to achieve our goals, then they will need to adapt accordingly and support the delivery process. If discovery is more important, then even software engineers will need to adapt and learn and how to help in the discovery more effectively. There is no way to split these things up. There is not a moment in time where it will be 100% discovery. There's no moment in time where it will be 100% delivery. Splitting this up is the most negative thing people could do related to absorbing your evidence. So this might be your new product backlog. I have customers in the real life before COVID where they had on one side a complete painted magnetic whiteboard wall and on the other side as well, 
And on one side, they had this wick and then mind mapped out this completing added wire frames and all of that stuff. And this is the goal being worked on. Once this goal started to be okay enough, so we saw the needles moving well enough, then they started with the next widely important goal on the other wall. Once this was fully completely done, they already had the brainstorm, the options available on that wall. So then they had to clean up this wall. They always needed to have spray, by the way, because it's been there for a long time. And then wiping a whiteboard out without spray is not going to work, by the way. So, so, and then they start on this wall. Once this wall starts to work out, they start figuring out this is going to be the next goal. So if people want to understand what's the possible future, they just have a view on the two walls and that's it. And they have all information available. These days, most probably they're doing it in Miro or Mural. So both are good enough for me. Uh, but that's an, a, a different view, uncovering better ways. You might even add stuff. Because now if we have mind maps, we might even add color and scale to it. So the bigger the, the bowl becomes, the node becomes, the more complex it is. The smaller it is, the lower the complexity. In this slide, you see three sizes. In real life, when I saw it on the, on the physical boards, they used many more. But everybody understands the bigger the node is, the more complex it is. The smaller the node is, the less complexity there is. Also, refinement state-wise, they actually added more of black stuff in, in, the, in the node or less black stuff to identify how much uncertainty is there still there. And it's okay to have, for example, here in the payment to have other, a black hole. You know, we don't know yet. And that's okay to identify we don't know yet and have a black hole in your system. If it becomes interesting or important, then we can do another refinement session, figure out what is more below it, and then it will have less black, black stripes in this node. So you can even complete and add, not stop in just product backlog wise. So the teams I work with used the same mind map to identify their sprint backlogs. So on sprint planning, they actually created this kind of positive scenarios, negative scenarios. They went more into details. They added more of the, the BDD test cases next to it. So spec by example wise, so they add this and then they used colors to show this is in production. This is actually done for us as a team, but it's not in production yet. If it's green, for example, then we can validate all three assumptions. If it's orange, so we have done our job, but it's not in production, maybe we can still validate if the what we are building is driving the behavior. So we can validate this assumption. By using the colors, we can actually validate and put check markers on the arrows, the connections between our mind map. The red, you see this as well, it's in development, it's in the current sprint. So, and this way we have all context, all information available in one view. More detail, less detail, so you can zoom in, zoom out, depending on what kind of interest you have on it. So aligning more teams on one specific business goal, having high levels of integration, in our products will enable business agility. It will enable us to experiment using soft languages, feature flags, say B testing, other practices, which frameworks are giving to us anyway. We can experiment and use the data. And by doing experimentation, we can innovate again. And if we innovate again, we can grow our business again. Without the ability to experiment and use the data and validate our assumptions rapidly, very rapidly, we disable our abilities to innovate. And if we cannot innovate, then our business will die over time. Then again, if you have a business or work in a business where they have lots of money, they will not die because they buy innovation. They let the old products die and they buy new products and they buy innovation. That's what the corporate politics are about. They have research departments, but if you look how much of the research is actually putting into production, that's very little because they don't know how, because they split discovery and delivery from each other. So bring it all back together. Don't get stuck in practices like I saw the to-do list and flat list of product backlogs in your answers. So really don't get stuck in practices. If you look at the Agile Manifesto, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. This is the main sentence for me. If you think the practice is the purpose, then this is, 
getting the agile way of working out of Scrum. So we want to have agility in Scrum, of course. Does this kind of transparency support this kind of business-based learning and this empiricism? Huge Excel files, Tira, backlog files. If we, people ask you, what is the possible future of your product? Will you send them a link to your Jira product backlog to show them this is the possible future? This is not really that helpful, is it? So, or is this a better approach? Understanding the mind map, understanding the assumption, understanding how it's all connected to each other. Or what about this? Where we have goals on the left side, learning metrics in the center, and then the things we do on the right side. Or this, very similar. So this is a real life example of a client I'm supporting at this moment in time. It's blurred out, so you cannot read it. So I comply to the NDAs, but you see a real life example. On the left part, we have the main purpose of our product. We have strategic capabilities, though widely important goals. Next to them, we see the learning metrics trends. If we are going to approach yes or no, if we are not doing well, it's red. If we're doing well, it's green. So, and next to it, on the same row, we see what kind of initiatives, what kind of things we are doing within the teams to actually influence this stuff. It's all in one view. In a review session, we can actually adapt. We can see, okay, those posters are done. Did it change those metrics, yes or no? Do we need to adapt? So this might be more appropriate ways of dealing with your product backlog. Making a successful company requires an intimate tango with the customers and your data, not a tight grip on this illusion where you have given the evidence that it is an illusion. For myself, my purpose is to really help organizations to build great products with great teams. Empirical up. And I'm ready for questions. Let me check the uh, Slack. What about changes to PB during the sprint, which influences the next one not done exactly during review? It's a complicated question for me. Um, I don't get it, the real question behind it. So I will need to make a hell of a lot of assumptions. I'm a stupid guy. Eh? So if you ask intelligent questions, then, I'm, then I cannot comprehend whatsoever. So changes during the in the product backlog during the sprint. Generally, where the teams I work with, we don't have that much changes in the product backlog during the sprint. It happens in the ref refinement sessions, which are happening during the sprint, but it's with all involved. So everybody is immediately up to date. There is shared learning happening. We zoom in level deeper. And the other part is in sprint review sessions. What is going to change? during the sprint, which is not shared with uh, all the teams and things, is that a product owner will define the next widely important goal and lack metric to work on. And that's where it stops. All the rest happens in collaborative sessions with individuals and interactions. I hope that was giving an answer, Jakub. If not, please elaborate on your question within Slack or over here. I don't know what is possible. Um, the, another question was, did business accept this kind of product overview in Miro, or did they, together with IT, develop it and how? <laughs> also a multi-dimensional multi question, I love it. So uh, you have seen that we combine discovery and delivery together, meaning we have business mandates, business skilled people, um, also working inside the teams together with technical uh, and less technical skills, skilled people. So it really is a cross-functional team as it is intended to by Scrum, by the way. So business isn't there, it's not that they are outside. This has been, the examples where I show this is being done with business and R&D teams and this, imaginary division that you have a business department and a T department was dismantled at that moment in time. Uh, to be very honest, this is never the starting point. Before you get in this scenario, most probably you went into a kind of an agile scrum adoption for a couple of months, maybe a year or two before you be able to use this kind of practice with mind maps. 
but the basic principle is still the same. It's about what is the business goal? How do we know we achieve? What are we going to do? Which kind of behavior is there? And making assumptions more explicit. Initially, when I started this thing, we did it from within the IT R&D department with what I would call a temporary fake product owner. Why a temporary fake product owner? It was a product owner from within R&D. They didn't have the business skills mentality insights yet. So they are, they are a temporary fake. And I think this is very respectful. I'm not giving you even the illusion. You are the product owner. You're a temporary fake one. You can grow the skills. You can grow the network to become the real product owner, or you will be replaced over time by the real business product owner. So, but we first build up the outcome-based mentality really driving business impact forward instead of the output-based delivery factories. This is the first step. And if this is being done and you can embrace your business department within the same structures, descaling organizational complexity. I hope this gives you an answer, Magdalena. I see thumbs up. No, this was not Magdalena, it was Dieter. Um, I think empirical level up is a reference to gaming. So it should bring only good memories. Yeah, um, I wrote a book about gamification in the business world, by the way. So um, I do love to bring in games, work, and joy. So work make, made fun gets done, you know? So And uh, people think about points and levels and batches if they think about gamification, but there is a hell of a lot more <laughs> that you could apply without having this kind of leveling thing. Uh, any more questions? What books can you advise for product owners in the fintech? Books that can advise to product owners in the fintech. To be honest, I would not even advise books. So if you are a product owner, and not, not only even in fintech, for me, the, the biggest learning I had was uh, back in 2006, when I became this lean startup coach in, an, uh, in a startup incubator. So I, I worked in a startup incubator with founders of companies. And if you are a bit familiar with the startup community, then you know they are having lots of meetups, even virtually. You can every day you can go somewhere and listen into founders, investors, and this is what you need to listen to. So go and join startup events where founders and investors are talking, having conversations and listen very carefully on how they manage their world, how they manage their investment spreads, how they manage on how to convince investors to put more money in their things, how they change and pivot, how they apply practices to learn from the market. Because as a true product owner, and you really own the product, you need to understand more about market shifts and market demands, and that market analysis becomes one of your biggest uh, uh, benefits. Um, to be honest, most of the books have great practices, and I would never go to an agile book, by the way, go to product management and product marketing books. I think you will learn more in those books to apply in an Agile world and in the Agile product management books. Now, this is uh, this for books. I hope this was good enough for you. Uh, thanks, long way to go. The business area so firmly anchored in their trenches that perhaps some disaster has to happen to make them open their eyes. They all co-create the product, yeah. So, I don't know. You say, Marta, uh, welcome on board, by the way. So you're uh, not an unfamiliar face. That's cool. Um, it, it's being told there that a disaster needs to happen before business can actually work like that. And this, I, I really disbelieve. Um, ever since my when I started working with Scrum, and that's back in 1998, by the way. So I've always been doing this with a high business sense. And if you can show that you drive business outcomes, more appropriately with different techniques, and you bring a hell of a lot of transparency on this, then business is happy to comply and, uh, and join forces. If you keep going with output and you keep focusing on we need to increase velocity, which is output driven again, then forget that a business will ever join in because you will keep delivering the wrong shit. 
And let's be honest, there is this popular Stanley's report getting out that, well, this is again 60 or 65% of the features being developed in software products are rarely or never used. As long as you keep building those, forget about business involvement. So the biggest benefit is not, not what Jeff Sutherland, which I hate, doubling, doubling the, the productivity. Uh, it's a fucking mistake. So it's about not building the, the wrong stuff. When I did base company to a less huge environment, they were tracking function points, which is definitely output driven, by the way, before we did anything agile. I asked them to keep tracking function points, but separate from the teams. They needed four people to track a, a five team uh, agile environment to keep, keep doing this, this function point analysis. After three months, we sent an, uh, an inquiry to the main stakeholders of this five team situation, asking them, do you think with the new way of working, we have a higher productivity? 92 or 93% of them said yes. Do you think we have higher quality? Again, around 80 or 90% said yes. So people, stakeholders felt like we have a higher productivity. If we then looked at the function point metrics, we saw a huge drop in productivity, but really not even a small, a huge drop in productivity. So what is now more important? So the feeling from the stakeholders that they felt like we do a lot more versus the function points. We were apparently doing a whole a hell of a lot less, but we were doing the right stuff. And you know, if people have lots of flies flying to them, they won't move. It's all small stuff. They don't even feel the impact of the flies coming to them. But if you're aligned to a single goal, this is an elephant running to you. You will feel the impact. And because you feel the impact, you have also the idea that we have a higher productivity. And that's, that's what we went for. So they ditched this function point analysis. They didn't look at output metrics anymore. And they really went more and more for this outcome, uh, outcome way of working. So Marta, I hope this was satisfying your question. If not, then after this talk, we can still continue the conversation on this uh, gather.town on the, let's say on the right bottom space somewhere. Uh, what is your experience with software delivery predictability metrics? Is it something that can help in a proper product development? I don't understand predictability metrics. That's one thing. So how to connect it to product, proper product development is uh, definitely not really easy. Um, I do understand that people need to have some idea about the, the dates or future things in the beginning. If you do transition from where we used to build products by means of projects, then people have this, this thing, we need dates and all that stuff. Until they really understand outcome-based driven product backlogs, then they forget about dates whatsoever. They only want to know what's the next thing coming up. And then salespeople sell a vision. They don't sell dates or features or anything. They sell the vision where they want to grow towards and they find partners in that journey as customers instead of customers where they want to rip off the most money possible. Um, but this is a journey. So predictability metrics, I think, is important to, to reach the end state, but it's definitely not needed anymore in the end state. You will need to have some kind of way to make sure that what you say is also going to happen to build trust. Because if you, if you say something and it's not going to happen, then you create distrust in your organization. So you will need to have something in hand to have a higher predictability in saying, okay, this is what we are going to do. And at the end, it's also happening. Um, I tend to shift this away as again from output thinking towards more of outcome thinking. We tend to drive impact on this business goal within this sprint and you will see it in that, in that moment in time. So instead of we are going to deliver this feature on that date. So this is the shift forward in the, in the predictability thinking. Another thing that I, in, that I really want to stretch, stretch, really want to give with you, uh, never, never, never use stretch goals. So if people go into a sprint, they, they should be, like it should be a walk in the park to reach their sprint goal, to, to, to do all the work that they said that they would do. It should really be a walk in the park. Um, what I tend to do sometimes is ask, ask people if they have a two-week sprint. So imagine it's a one-week sprint. What can you do and what would be the sprint goal? And this is what we put officially out there. 
And then we say, okay, well, that was in the, in the rest of the, this one week that is still there. So we split the sprint in half and we say, this is what we're going to do. And then we add something. Those, all the things that are added for the second week is optional. And this way we relieve the pressure of this thing and we become a hell of a lot more predictable because we only plan for half of the sprint. So we definitely do what we said we would do. And we still have boundaries open if something pops up from your evidence, from the metrics you have given. This will happen in the sprint as well, that we can have the ability and have the time to absorb that learning within the sprint as well. And I will, so there's still five minutes to go. Maybe there's one more to, to go there that the title art of doing twice the work and all the time is rather unfortunate indeed. Um, it's clickbait, I guess. Now, unfortunately, many managers think that this is the, the reality and they still think output and then it's like, let's do agile. So I know we're going to get twice the output with the same amount of people, which is uh, not going to happen whatsoever. So this would be the, the wrong thing. And I think this is a teaching moment. If this is their intention to drive Agile forward, you need to embrace it as a teaching moment to them. That it's not about twice the amount of work, it's twice the amount of impact by doing the right stuff and not doing the wrong stuff. Cool, I don't see any more uh, questions popping up, which is great. There are still four minutes to go. So, but for those four minutes, you can all take some coffee. It was a pleasure having you on board, getting me here. I hope you enjoyed the talk. So leave some feedback on the, what is it? Muro, Miro. So My one of those two. And I'm uh, happily oh. open to keep discussing stuff on Gather the Town somewhere at the right bottom part. Okay. Thank you.